looking at verse 5 and 6. We're going to be looking at verse 5 and 6, the two verses. You know, um, that is Psalm 23. Psalm 23 verses 5 and 6. It says, verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed and refreshed my head with oil. My cup overflows. And verse 6 now says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. 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 All right. I'm going to be asking us some questions. So um, I'm going to be asking us some questions, especially uh, in relation to verse 5. Remember, last week we said God led us through the valley of the shadow of death. And then, you know, while he was leading us, last week we looked at what normally happens in that valley. A valley is a place of loneliness, a place of depression, a place, you know, where, I mean, things look as if they don't work out or the things are not working out for us, you know. And the Bible says, what it, before, it was leading us through the path of righteousness and that path has taken us through the valley that looks like death, but it's not death. But right now, we have passed through that valley and anytime you allow God to lead you, you allow God to lead you through the path of righteousness. You allow God to lead you in, in, into his own path, not in the path that you want. Then that path can lead you through where, I mean, through what can scare you sometimes. It can lead you to somewhere that you will think, oh, what am I doing here? How did I find myself here? That is the valley of the shadow of death. But once you release yourself to the Lord, and we know that in that valley, we said even in that valley, there is refreshment. In the valley that looks like everything is gone, there is refreshment. And last week we looked at the rod and the staff of God that, that, that brings refreshment unto us. They bring comfort to our soul that even though I'm passing through what I don't like, but God is with me. That is the refreshment there. God is with me. So now we've passed through that and then we are out of the valley. Right now, we are out of the valley, you know, the valley or the tunnel or maybe the alleyway. We are now out. And where have we found ourselves? We have found ourselves where our shepherd has prepared a table before us. A table before us in the presence of our enemies. He has anointed our head with oil. Then our cup rolls over. So we're going to be looking at these key words as usual. You know, he has prepared a table before me. Where has he prepared the table? In the presence of my enemies. In the presence of those who thought I will not get out of that alleyway. In the presence of those who thought I will perish in the valley of the shadow of death. Those who have abandoned me. That was what David was thinking about as a shepherd. Remember David was a shepherd boy that was abandoned in the bush by his elder brothers, by his family. All right. It was from the bush, from that bush, that David was sent for. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 16, when the Lord asked Samuel to go and anoint one of the sons of Jesse as king over Israel. So, and when he was trying to anoint them, he, he wanted to anoint the first one. God said, no, I've rejected this one. It's not fit. He wanted to anoint the second one. God said, no, the third one, no. And all the seven sons passed. And, and God did not choose any of these seven sons. And Samuel was wondering, God, you sent me here. So you had to ask Jesse, are these all your sons? And Jesse said, eh, they are the the youngest. You know, so he, he, David knew what it was, what it meant to be abandoned. To be abandoned in the valley of the shadow of death. To be abandoned to wild animals. To take care of the sheep alone, a young boy, a young man, a lad, a teenager. To be abandoned in the in the wilderness to take care of sheep where you find lions, you find bears, you find wolves. So he knew firsthand. And right from that place, David was called out. You know, he was sent for. 
and right in the presence of his enemies, his brothers, who thought that he would have perished, you know, because he was, it was like he was a nobody. Right in the presence of his enemies, the Lord asked Samuel to pour oil on David. And that is what we are looking at tonight, in the presence. So when you come out of that valley, out of the valley of the shadow of death, when you come out of that valley, out of the storm, out of problem, out of what you thought would overwhelm you, will overshadow you, will kill you, out of that, when you pass, when you come out of that, then you see that you are coming to your enlarged place, a place of enlargement. And that is why before we go for that, I want to encourage you. I don't know what you are passing through. And it seems as if, you know, people are, people are looking at you as if that will be the end. That is, that is our end. Or that is his end. Oh, I don't think he can come out of this alive. Or maybe they think you cannot come out of it joyfully. But you know that the rod and the staff of God comfort you. His word is backing. His protection. They comfort you. So they give you comfort that though you, you might be passing through tribulation, you are not going to perish in that tribulation. Now, in the presence of all those who are waiting to laugh at you, to laugh at you, to ridicule you, to mock you, to reproach you, in their presence, God is now saying in that verse 5, I am setting a table. So we are going to be looking at that table. You have set, you have prepared. You know, it's not like when I come, God will now start to prepare. Please, let's take note of those key words. No, he said you will prepare a table. So know that you will prepare. It's not you will prepare. You will prepare. Thou preparest. So it's like God knows I'm coming out of this because he, after all, is my shepherd. And he's leading me out of that wonky place. He's bringing me to my large place. So he has prepared a table to refresh my soul further. To refresh me. So that's what we are looking at tonight. All right, I like the message version. Can I ask someone to read the message version to us? If you have the message version of Psalm 23, verse 5, message version. You know, it's the, I love the message version. You know, sometimes you look at it, the language is very, very, um, um, it's very, very contemporary. Let me just use the word contemporary. So if no one is there, I'm going to read um, Psalm 23, verse 5, the message version. It says, you serve me. A cease cause dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. You serve me a cease cause dinner. I don't know if any of you, I don't know if any of you has been served a cease cause dinner before. All right. I don't know if any of you have been served a cease cause dinner. Yes, I've, I've removed the muting so you can unmute yourself. All right. So, or if you want, does anybody want to omit themselves? Okay, if you want to read, please just put your thumbs up. So I just want, I want our, our platform to be a little bit orderly. All right. So, thank you. Oh, you can. Right. Oh, yes. I've had a six course, a six course dinner. You've had a six course a, a China, dinner a Chinese, a Chinese, when the Chinese get married, they do a six course dinner. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I have, okay, maybe... Maybe at, um, what do you call this place? Um, this global buffet. This global buffet. Maybe that's where I, I will still have experienced a six course dinner before. When you eat all you can. I you will eat all I you can. Out. I will do that. Said, I carried my belly. <laughs> you will definitely have to carry your belly. You know? So in such a situation. And that is what God has prepared for us. A six course dinner. And that's the reason why when you are passing through trouble, please persevere. Please persevere. Because the temptation or the examination that you are passing through is for you to be celebrated. So please persevere. Do not run away. Do not run away. All right? So, and let's look at it very well. So, six cause dinner. Um, please, if you want to speak, don't, just let me see your hand. I mean... Use the um, reaction button. Let me see your hand if you want to speak. So when you talk about preparing a table before us, what does this signify? So the, the, the delicious me, what does it bring to us? Anybody? Anyone on this platform? The sister's dinner, what does it bring unto us? So if you, if you, want, if you want to unmute yourself, yes, you can. Uh -huh. 
Uh, fulfillment. Right. Fulfillment. It brings fulfillment. Yes. What else does it bring onto us? The six course good, dinner. Good balanced diet. Balanced diet. Okay. Thank you. Brings balanced diet. Yes. I think Agnes. What does it bring to us? All right, what does it bring to us? If I overflow. ask you to unmute, just unmute, yes. Overflow. Overflow, overflow, overflow. It brings overflow onto us. So anytime we have the six cost, I mean, anytime we say God prepares a table, we are talking about abundance. We are talking about abundance, overflow. That's what we are talking about. Abundance, overflow, all right? So we are talking about satisfaction. We are talking about provision, satisfaction, provision, overflow, abundance. That's what we are talking about, all right, in this place. So Psalm 23 verse 5 reminds us that he can, God can, and will do everything to provide what we need. God can, that is number one, and he will. Because remember I said, it's the summit did not say he is preparing a table or he's going to prepare a table or he will prepare a table the table has already been prepared and that table is not just an ordinary table it's a table that is full a full full of everything that we need everything that we need everything that will refresh your soul when you have come out of the valley of the shadow of death remember you might be dry you know, you would have prayed and prayed. Look at Jesus. When Jesus finished fasting, the Bible says the angels came and ministered unto him. They gave him everything he needed. So I want to encourage you. Please do not run away from um, storm. Do not run away from, you know, it's better you stay and trust in the rod and the staff of God. And at the end of the storm, there is a table awaiting you. There is a table awaiting you. All right. So even though you have walked through the valley, through the dark valley, perhaps the darkest valley ever, God will lead you through it so successfully so that you can reach the other side. The danger will be behind you and you will transition into its marvelous light. You will move into its marvelous light. It is then after you leave the valley, you will find its only table. You will find his only table. And this table illustrates abundance, satisfaction, everlasting love. So you can feast at his table of endless love and grace. And no enemy of any sort can take that away from you. No enemy of any sort. You see, David reminds us of valleys. David has experienced valleys a lot. So he reminds us of one in Psalm 118, verse 5 to 7. Psalm 118, verse 5 to 7. The Bible says, David says, Out of my deep anguish and pain, I prayed. You helped me as a father. You helped me as a father. You came to my rescue and broke open the way into a beautiful and broad place. Now I know, Lord, that you are for me. And I will never fear what can man do to me for you stand yes, beside me as my hero who rescues me <clears throat> i've seen with my own eyes the defeat of my enemies i've triumphed over them all so david has experienced you know um has experienced valley before all right david has experienced valley before so he can actually talk about valley he has experienced he can talk about it now let's look at oil he says you pour oil upon me. You pour oil upon me. I want someone to tell us what type of oil. Please use the reaction button. Use the reaction button to, I mean, to raise up your hand. What type of oil? Or maybe um, show your video. What type of oil is, I mean, was David referring to when he said, you pour oil upon me? What type of oil? Anybody? What type of oil? All right. Unmute yourself. Yes. I think it's the oil of um, anointing. 
the one that Samuel poured on him to anoint him. And it's a special oil that is made for kings. A special oil made for kings. Especially the oil of anointing. So we can see anointing in that oil. What else is in that oil? Anybody else? What else is in the oil that David, that David was referring to? He said, thou anointest my head with oil. So what type of oil? Apart from the oil of anointing, or do we think it's just anointing alone that is in the oil? What type of oil? Anyone? What type of oil? Is it, is it oil for protection? Thank you. It's part of it. We're going to look at it. Oil for protection. Oil for protection. Oil for protection. Yes. What type of oil again? Jackie, you want to say something? What yeah. type of oil? Is it kind of oil that um, Jesus was anointed with? So you are still talking about anointing again. Oil yeah. of anointing. So it's still anointing. So Agnes says oil of protection. So you are saying oil of anointing. I want us to look at that oil. What does it represent? Yes. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. It represents Holy Spirit. Or let me just say, what does the oil do? Lubricate. So we've talked about protection and um, anointing. So it's the oil of the Holy Spirit, but what does it do? It lubricates. It lubricates. There is lubrication in the oil, yes. Anybody else? What, what does the oil do? Is it the, the, was it that the oil was mixed with, um, with things that made it smell? I make it smell. Is it fragrance? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right, Jackie. Yes. Yes. The oil smells. I'm. I'm coming to that, Agnes, because the oil actually smells. All right. So, Jackie. Yes. What did you want to say? It's what type of oil? Oil of almost like love. Oil of love. That yeah. love yes. That, that there is love. love. That will give you um, trust and faith and, and vision and you know. Yes, that kind of. Yes, that's part of it. So let me quickly give. Do you mean cover? Do you mean the oil covered us, covers you? Yes, it's part of it because it's oil of protection. It covers us. It's oil. It's, it's, it's an oil. The oil has protection in it. Yes, yes. Pastor Bankole, I've forgotten the name, but there's this um name they give the special oil that God told them. There's a patch. I don't know whether it's mayor or whatever. God gave them specification on how to make the oil that they are going to use to annoy the kings, but I've forgotten the names. And there's the, um, it has a special significance, but I've forgotten okay. the names. Okay, okay. So you, you, it's still oil of anointing. It's, it's, it's still an anointing oil. Let me quickly tell you the contents of the oil. All right? So the oil, in that oil, you know, if you look at the life of David, there are so many things we can infer from his life. I'm going to tell you the literal, I mean, the practical aspect, and I'm going to tell you the, the real reason why shepherds use oil to anoint their sheep, mm -hmm. all right? So we are going to look at it from the spiritual or practical side, and we're also going to look at it from, you know, what our, the reason why shepherds, in, in actual fact, in the, real, in the real world, why shepherds use oil to anoint yeah. So let's quickly just write it down because when the Lord has brought you out of that valley into an enlarged place and is anointing your head with oil, we say, okay, number one, we've talked about oil as anointing. So that oil is the oil of anointing and anointing is, is for you, you know, to, to, to receive power to do what you couldn't or what you can, what you cannot do naturally. So the anointing is the oil is to anoint you to receive power to do what you cannot naturally do. So that's part of the contents of the oil. You know, you receive power when you say it's an anointing. Anointing is in the oil. You see, anytime oil is being poured on anyone, you see, they will say there is a release of anointing. So what does the anointing do? Anointing breaks the yoke. Anointing releases power. In the book of Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, 
we talked about anointing, breaking the yoke. So whatever you have passed through, whatever might be the remnants of your experience, you know, in the valley of the shadow of death, you see that the anointing that God pours upon you breaks every joke. Breaks every joke. So that is number one, is the oil of anointing. And that anointing is to empower you, to engrace you, to break every joke that will not allow you to move the way you want to. And in that oil, you find revival. Is the oil of revival. You find revival. Remember, it says, you revive my drooping head. Remember that we have been using our head. You know, we've been, we've been, we've been troubled while we pass through the valley of the shadow of death. We pass through storm. But right now, we come out. The oil is to revive our drooping head. We are tired. The oil is to revive us. That's why the oil is called the oil of revival. The oil of revival. And it's also the oil of refreshment. It's the oil of refreshment. As it is poured on you, it sinks into your head. You know, something happens. You are refreshed. You are refreshed. So it's the oil of refreshment. And out of that, you can get innovation. Because it is when you are refreshed that you experience innovation. So I will call it oil of innovation too. Because if you are tired, if you are, if you are experiencing storm, you cannot innovate. You cannot be creative. You can't even think straight. But when the oil comes upon you, after your trial, and you've passed the trial, his rod and his staff has brought you to a table. Right on that table, he pours oil on you, and you are able to innovate. It's the oil of insight. You see, it's the oil of insight. You are able to see what you have not seen before. It's the oil of insight. All right? And I will also call it, the oil of healing, the oil of healing, and the oil of prevention, all right? And these two, the oil of healing, the oil of prevention, and even the oil of protection. This three, I'm going to look at it from a typical shepherd's point of view. A typical shepherd, you know, when a shepherd is driving the sheep, let's look at why do shepherds anoint their sheep, you know, with oil. Why do they anoint? I remember that David was a shepherd. So David understood the work of a shepherd. He understood what she passed through, what they passed through. So it is his understanding, his basic understanding that has informed this Psalm 23. All right. So let's look at what the oil does. So we say healing, prevention, and protection. You no. Know? So how, why does the um, shepherd, why do shepherds use the oil? When, number one, when I say oil of prevention, what does it prevent? Injury. Oil of prevention, you know, it prevents injury. You see sheep, the ram, the male sheep, the ram, you know, they have horns. They have horns and they love to fight. I remember growing up in Nigeria during the Muslim festival, they will use ram and they normally buy ram with long, long horns. They will use them in combat. They use them as sports. So because, you know, they kill ram for their festival. So they will use ram and the rams they buy. We normally go to watch this competition when we were children, when we were young. So the, the rams will be fighting. So the shepherd, the shepherd that has, you know, his fold is made up of sheep and rams. So what does he do? He annoys the head of this ram to prevent injury when they head but, when they fight and head but. Because I, I remember then why we watched these rams fight when we were young. You know, I don't usually like such violence because at the end of the day, you find that their heads will be bleeding. Their, the heads of the, because they will be head butting and head butting and the heads will be bleeding. Rams naturally fight. So for that reason, because the shepherd knows this, he annoys the head, he uses a special oil to oil their, their horn. And even the head, so that when they are trying to interlock, when they are trying to interlock their horns, you know it will be slippery. It will be slippery. All right. So that's one of the reasons prevention of injury. When the Lord anoints your head, is to prevent your head from being injured. Is to prevent your head from what? From being injured. From injury. From injury. Number two. Why do shepherds anoint? the heads of the sheep with oil is to make it easier
for sheep to untangle their head. Because sheep can get their head caught in briars and thorns and they might die while trying to untangle themselves. You know, because they go through the, 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 the bush, they go through the wilderness. And, you know, sheep are social animals. So sometimes they put their head where they are not supposed to. So if care is not taken, the head might be entangled with, you know, in briars, in thorns, in, in all these white ropes. So the reason why shepherds anoint the head of their sheep is when they put eggs in these briars, you know, the head is slippery. They can easily untangle themselves. So God anoints your head with oil. So that when you are about to get into trouble, the anointing rescues you. The anointing does what? Rescues you. That's what shepherds do. Number three, another reason why shepherds anoint because like I said, David was speaking from experience. He wrote Psalm 23 from experience. So the number three reasons is oil serve as repellent. And that was what Agnes said. You know, when Agnes said, you know, there is fragrance in the oil. Yes, there is fragrance in the oil. In the olden days, in the time of the shepherds, you know, of the Bible. You no, know, thank God for today because of um, because of so many um, uh, products available that can repel, you know, flies. In the olden days, they anoint the head of um, sheep with oil because, you know, flies, flies let lies to perch. They perch on the heads of the sheep and even in their noses, their nostrils, they perch there and they hatch their eggs inside the noses. And so it becomes itchy. It becomes itchy. And once the nostrils become itchy, what happens? The, the sheep will become uncomfortable. So in trying to get rid of the itching, in their nose and the itching in their head they start to bang their head against anything they see because they are sheep they don't have hands to put their hands into their nose to remove whatever is itching them so what they can think of is to bang their head bang their head and many sheep have died as a result of this banging and banging so because of that shepherds that are alert what do they do they watch out for the four signs of itching when they see that sheep are becoming uncomfortable they, they immediately know that the flies have started to perch on them. So they use this oil mixed with its olive oil, but it's mixed with some fragrances, some um, insect repellents. They use that to rub the nose of the of the um, sheep and they pour the oil on the sheep. So the oil, the sheep is soaked. In the air is soaked with the oil. So flies cannot perch there. And at the same time, the effect of the, the effect of um, flies. The eggs that are hatched, the effects are minimized and the sheep do not die. You see, many of us, God has been faithful to us. God has been very, very faithful in the sense that as our shepherd, there are many flies that the enemy has thrown our way. These flies, what do they do? They want to perch on us and make us uncomfortable. But our shepherd, who senses, who is constantly watching out for us, he anoints our head with oil so that because sometimes God will see that if he permits this thing to happen to you, hey, some of us will bang our head against the wall. That is why it's a pity for those who don't have any shepherd over their soul. They don't have God or Jesus as the shepherd of their soul. Because when the devil comes and begins to trouble them, what they will think they will be running from pillar to post. So I challenge you today and I encourage you. Is there anything you are passing through right now? Is there anything that is disturbing your life? There is a shepherd that has the oil that can relieve you of every itching. Whatever it is that is disturbing your life. There is a shepherd and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. So I want us to put our confidence in the Lord. Because if not for him, if not for God, if not for God, in our, if not for Jesus, the shepherd of our soul, Many of us, when trouble comes, we run at a scatter. Hmm? We run to people that cannot help us. We run to shepherds that do not know how to take care of the sheep. Shepherds themselves who are sheep, who do not even know their right from their left. We run to them. But Jesus, the shepherd, David was speaking from experience. He knew how to take care of his shepherd. So that was why he said, God, you are my shepherd. Even before trouble comes, you can smell it. You can see that when I'm uncomfortable, remember Psalm 139, verse 1 to 2. 
David says, Lord, you know my sitting down. You know my standing up. You know when I'm uncomfortable. You know when I'm comfortable. Because he is my shepherd. So shepherds anoint their sheep so that flies, they, I mean, to relieve them of, of, of the effect of flies or, or, the, or the hatching of eggs. Because when these flies hatch their eggs on, on the nostrils of the, of the sheep, sheep can do anything. They can bang their head because they want to be relieved. So the anointing upon your head is to ward off flies from coming near you. So ward off flies. And if you are already feeling some itching, the anointing is being poured out tonight. And that anointing is to relieve you in the name of Jesus. Why else? You know, does the shepherd anoint the sheep? There is a disease they call scab. This disease affects, you know, she um, sheep. So, and when once they affect the sheep, what happens? The you know, like I said before, sheep are social animals. So they love to rub. To it's like they it's like they can't embrace, but they love to add birds. They love to rub themselves on themselves, you know, and through that they can pass on the disease. They can pass on the disease from one person, from one sheep to another. So the oil is poured on the head of the sheep so that they will not be able to pass on disease from one, from, from, I mean, from, so they, they will not be able to pass on diseases amongst themselves. So God anoints us. God anoints us. All right. And lastly, lastly, to prevent torments. To prevent torment. That's the, that's, that's the essence of the oil. Because whatever happens to the sheep, whether it is during storm, during storm or during stormy weather or whatever, whatever it happens, you, you see, whether they are experiencing flies or scab or whatever, the oil that is being poured on the sheep is to prevent, to, pre, to, to prevent mental torment, to prevent torment on the sheep. So our shepherd will never allow us to be tormented. And if there's anyone experiencing any form of torment, pray that the oil of grace, the oil of anointing will be outpoured upon us. If there's any member of our household that is experiencing torment, the shepherd of our soul will touch them tonight in the name of Jesus. And quickly, let's look at my cup runs over. We've talked about cup, you know. The Bible says when it says my cup runs over, it's talking about, you know, before, you know, Remember when you when you come out of that valley of the shadow of death, remember the table. And at the table, we said it's a six course meal. So on that table, you have food, you have drinks. So God is now waiting on you. You know, it's like he's your host now, waiting on you because you have passed the test. So he's waiting on you, he's anointing you, he's, he's, he's giving you food. Let my cup runs over means that as you are drinking out of the cup, before it empties out, is refilling. I don't know if some of you have experienced that when you go to a, a nice restaurant. And, you know, before, I remember when my husband and I went on a second honeymoon after our 25th wedding anniversary. This restaurant, you know, in fact, they, 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 they will spoil you to the, I mean, this hotel, you said that we, they will spoil you to, 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 to the last. In fact, don't even pour water. There was somebody that was standby pouring what if I, I didn't use my hand to do anything. Before the cup runs out, they're already feeling it. That's what God does for us. That's what God does. So when you work with him and you allow his rod and his staff to guide you, your cup will never run dry. Before it runs out, it will refill. Before you remember what Jesus said. He said, even out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So you will never ever experience dryness because your shepherd is taking care of you, is waiting on you, is providing for you, is filling you, is providing, is giving you water for your thirstiness, is giving you wine. So my cup runs over. You know, it's not like the English cup. You know the English um, tea cup, very very small. <laughs> I remember when uh, Sister Jeronica first um, gave me a mug as a gift, very small. As I said, Jeronica, I'm an African woman. You know, we don't use small cups for tea, you know, in Africa. We use big cup. I mean, I, I'm a Yoruba lady. I grew up with big cup. So now, we, what we are talking about here is not like the small, you know, the Chinese cup, the tea cup. No. 
the cup that even when you drink and drink, you will say, I'm okay. I remember when we went to um, America. My children, and then we now went to their McDonald's. You know the McDonald's here? <laughs> when you buy your medium-sized cup or your um, is it large cup, once you finish, that's it. <laughs> the first time my brother's children came to the UK, and I took them to McDonald's. So, prone before you know it, my, my nephew had finished drinking the cup. He just took the cup back to the wet and to the till and he said, Can I have a refill, please? Can I have a refill? Ah. And I looked at him and said, There is no refill here. <laughs> you buy, you buy, and when you finish your cup, you pay for another one. So when we now went to America and now saw what, what made him, you know, to ask for more because there is, uh, they don't, they, they are, they are, they are, what do you call it? They are drink, um, um, fountain is not behind their desk like the McDonald's here. The McDonald's here, the drink fountain is by the door. So you drink and drink. Oh, 99, 99, is it 99 pence or what do they spend here? You, your cup, you drink and drink and their cup is like this, very big and giant. You drink and drink. I looked at it and said, hey, these people will kill somebody. That's why they are, you know, big. So what I'm saying, the kind of cup that God gives to you is a cup that you will say, God, ha, ah, <laughs> thank you, you know, because as you, before you get thirsty, it's already filling you up. It's already filling. So that's what David, David, when David says, my cup runs over, Jesus promised or said, press down, shaking together, running over. That's what God gives. God does not give half cup, you know. God does not give half cup, you know, or half tea. No, 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 no. He fills your cup up. He fills it up. All right. Let's read um, 2 Peter 1 3. 2 Peter 1 3. The Bible says, For his divine power has bestowed upon us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through truth and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So God has bestowed everything that we need, everything we could ask for, he has bestowed it upon us. And so our cup running over also signifies refreshment, refreshment in time. You know, when God refreshes your cup, he refreshes, he refreshes. Remember we said Psalm 23 is the Psalm of refreshment. He refreshes your cup, he refreshes your cup, all right? So no matter the storm that we face, let me also tell you the significance of my cup running over. Let me also tell you, shepherds, because for my research, shepherds, during the time of storm, you know, in going and going, and they can get to a place. And it, it, maybe the time of storm or during winter, winter, the lamb can be, especially the smallest ones among them, they can be very, very cold. Very, very cold. A, a, a shepherd that is alert, we notice when the lamb is feeling cold, because cold can kill them. Especially the cold can kill them. So I've researched into it and I see that some shepherds say that they carry a bottle of wine, I mean, a bottle of um, scotch or um, what do you call this, um, this, um, this drink, you know, um, this hot drink, scotch, or is it, what do they call this, this, um, this alcoholic um, drink, but very strong one. They carry a bottle of that and a bottle of water. Then they now mix it. They said only when the when the lamb, when the lamb is feeling extremely cold, then they open his mouth, quickly pour some at least little drops into into his mouth. As soon as the thing lands in his tummy, he jumps up and begins to jump around. You know, <laughs> begins to jump around because now he has received energy, and you will never believe that he's cold again. But when the shepherd is not alert and the lamb gets cold. As a result of storm or winter, they die. They can die. So when David was talking from that experience of taking care of lambs, you know, taking care of, of, the, of the young amongst them, those who are susceptible to cold, and how he comes to, to, to revive them. And then you now see that they, they start to bubble. They become bubbling. And the shepherds have talked about their experience, about how joyful, how amazing, how amusing it is when they see these small, I mean, these um, um, little lambs, when they jump up after a drop of uh, wine or whatever, um, a scotch, after a drop of scotch into their mouth and water. 
So when we experience dry, dryness, or maybe we experience storm in our lives, we come to a junction that we are called. Then you see, that is why we need to run to the Holy Spirit. You do not stay in your junction of coldness. You do not stay in your junction of storm. You run to the one. I don't know if you have experienced it before. When you feel so down, so down. And then when you start to pray in the Holy Ghost, you start to pray to the Lord. You see the infusion of the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You that was just thinking of, you know, that you were down before. All of a sudden you find out that that joy comes in you. And you just feel so bubbly. And people cannot understand how you transit from that level to that level. It is the joy of the Holy Ghost. It is the wine of the Holy Ghost. And that is what our shepherd does to us. Anytime you are feeling down, I encourage you. You know, let the Holy Spirit infuse you with strength. Let the Holy Spirit energize you. So your cup will run over when the Holy Spirit energizes or infuses you with strength. That's why Apostle Paul says, I can do all the Philippians 4.13. Through Christ who infuses me with inner strength. As a shepherd will infuse, you know, the, the small lamp, the, the small lamp, the little lamp with a little scotch that will revive it. That is what our shepherd does. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 to 16. The Bible says, saying that we have a great high priest that is praised into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have a shepherd that have passed through storm before. A shepherd that have felt the lowest ebb in life before. Remember Gethsemane. Remember Gethsemane. That's why the Bible says in this Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 to 16. The high priest that we follow. The shepherd of our soul that we follow. He understands when people feel low. He understands when people feel so down and so low. So we can always run to him. And it will infuse us with inner strength. Now to the last verse quickly, which is verse 6. Psalm 23, verse 6. Remember, we've been considering Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 6. says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. I remember one time in Redeemed Christian Church of God. You know, everybody will say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us. All the and they said, no, 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 no. When David wrote this psalm, he didn't say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us. He says, shall follow me. All right? So, so, you must know what is following you. Because if you say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us, and you are pluralizing, you are plural, uh, pluralizing it, you might not know whether there is another thing following the person next to you. You know what is following you. So, David was very sure. David was very sure. He said, surely, I know for sure. Because I understand what my shepherd does for me. I know for sure that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I want you to take note of that. Please. How many days of your life? All. All. Not yesterday and today is not there. No. He says all the days of my life because my shepherd is there taking care of me. All the days of my life. He said, and I shall dwell forever in the house and in the presence of the Lord. I shall dwell forever. You know, let's look at the Passion Translation. That verse is the Passion Translation of that Psalm 23 verse. The Passion Translation says, why would I fear the future? Why would I fear tomorrow? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is true, I will return to your glorious presence to be with you forever. So he says, surely, no, why would I fear the future? Why would I fear tomorrow? For your goodness and love pursue me. Your goodness and love, they do what? They pursue me. They follow me. They chase after me. They pursue me. They pursue me. Can anybody tell us what does goodness and mercy, what, what, do, what do this signify? Goodness and mercy. Please raise up your hand so I can unmute you. Or maybe I can ask everybody to unmute. 
I will just send, I will just ask everyone to unmute if you want to speak. All right, we we'll send the invitation. So, what does that goodness and mercy, you know, what does this signify? What does this signify? If you want to speak, you know, just unmute yourself. What does this signify? Anyway, um, even though we are we are sinners, and even though that we are sometimes unfaithful, God mm. still forgives us. And he's still God always still forgives faithful. us. Yes. Yes. Anyone? When he says, "Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me," what does that say to you? Yeah. So it's um, what we don't deserve. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, all the protection. Um, grace, love, provision, mm. even what though we, don't we don't, yeah, even though we don't deserve it. What we don't deserve, yes. Anybody else? Thank you. What we don't deserve, yes. I'm looking for some revelation so, here. So, yes. Unending love of God. Unending love. Unending love of God, yes. Unending love of God. Yes. I suppose it's unconditional as well. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Yes. It's when you say goodness and mercy shall follow me. Goodness. Good is taken out of goodness. Who is good? God. God. Who is merciful? God. God. He's the same God. So when he says goodness and mercy shall follow me, <laughs> the Bible says God is rich in mercy. Mm -hmm. And several times in the Bible, he introduced himself as the merciful God. So when he says goodness, God is good. No one else is good. So whatever is good is God. God is good. Then God is the owner of mercy. He is very, very rich in mercy. So when goodness and mercy follow you, it means God is following you. He's watching your back. Because he says, shall follow me. So as a shepherd, you know, shepherds, they just move, they move, they just, you know, in fact, sometimes they don't even look at where they're going. They're just going because they're, I mean, the, I mean, the sheep, the sheep, just they go, they just go. They don't look at where they're going. But the shepherd, knows because the shepherd is coming he sees far beyond you know what far beyond what the sheep can see so the goodness which goodness represents god mercy represents god he said all the days of my life i don't have to fear i don't have to fear what people fear i don't have to be looking over my back when i look over my back what do you see goodness and mercy that's what you see no trouble following you you know like one, one stupid song that um, somebody composed, one of these um, artists in Nigeria said, and trouble follow them, palaver follow them. You know what you call palaver? Palaver means something that will trouble you, you know? He said, he said mercy follow me, goodness follow me. David confessed, he said, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Goodness and mercy. And I want you to have that assurance from today. That anytime you look over your back, if you just look at your back, what do you see? Goodness and mercy following you. Amen. Goodness and mercy following you. All right? They cover your back. The mercy of God covers you. Amen. The goodness of God covers you. Amen. One of the key prayers the Lord taught me, the early days of the ministry, said, said I should pray, Lord, cover my back. And so, which means the goodness and mercy, they are there to cover your back. They are there to cover my back. They are there to cover our back. Can we read Isaiah 58 verse 8? Isaiah 58 verse 8. You know, Isaiah 58. You know, anytime I look back, I only see God's goodness and mercy tagging along, following me everywhere I go. So when people look at you, there's something spectacular about you. There is something special about you. You cannot see it, but they see. People see. They just see that there is. They see this halo around you. You know, Isaiah fifty-eight verse eight. I don't know if anyone is there that wants to read Isaiah fifty-eight verse eight. Then your light shall break. Mm. For, um, sorry. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Mm. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. 
Mm. And your righteousness shall go before you. Mm -hmm. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Shall be your rear guard. The righteousness shall go before you. Your light will break forth. Say, but the glory of the Lord. So where is the glory of the Lord? Your rear guard behind you. That's goodness and mercy. You remember I said goodness represents God. Mercy represents God. And now he's talking about what will be behind us. The glory of the Lord. Where you find the glory of the Lord. Isn't God present there? God is present. Please go about your daily duty with confidence from today, knowing that God has got your back mm -hmm. everywhere you go. God has done what? He has got your back. God has got your back. All right? So, and let's read Exodus 33 verse 14. Another Bible verse, Exodus 33 14. That's what we are ending with tonight as we, as we conclude this psalm of refreshment. Exodus, you know, um, 33 verse 14. Exodus 33 verse 14. The Bible says, And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. My presence shall go with you. So, my presence shall go with you. David says, When goodness and mercy follows me, they will follow me till I come to your presence. Your, you know, all the days of my life, the presence of the Lord is with you. Even after this act, you are moving on to his presence. So it is presence all through your life and through eternity. Said my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. So when you talk about goodness and mercy, the book of Romans chapter 9 verse 15 talks about mercy as belonging unto the Lord. Romans 9 15. For God says, I will show mercy. Unto him I will show mercy because he's the owner of mercy. All right? Even the book of Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 to 7. Exodus 34, 6 to 7 talks about God. It says, I am the Lord. I am slow to hunger and I'm abounding in steadfast love and mercy. I am the merciful God. That's how he introduced, he introduced himself to Moses as the merciful God. So when God now says goodness and mercy shall follow you, which means I will be following you. I will be following you. I will be following you. That was what he meant. All right. And let's leave. I mean, let's end tonight with John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. If you are there, please, you may read for us. John 14, 27. John 14, 27. I'm going to read. If you are, if you are not there yet, it says, I leave the gift of peace with you. My peace. All right? Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. Let me read the word of Jesus to you again. John 14, 27, the Passion Translation. John 14, 27. I leave the gift of peace with you as we end this Psalm 23. Amen. Because when you talk about refreshment, it's all about peace. It's all about joy. The presence of the Lord brings peace. All right? He says, I leave the gift of peace with you. My peace. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. But it now gives a warning. Do not yield to fear or be troubled in your heart. Instead, be courageous. Instead, be courageous. But the peace of God, you know, it's not a peace that you're going to be praying for. It's a peace you just need to open your eyes and gain access to. It's not a peace that is going to be manufactured tomorrow. It's not like the word peace that everybody says, uh, let the world have peace, uh, peace of the world. Oh, we are pursuing uh, uh, the peace. No, no, that is not the kind of peace. Peace that is there to, today, tomorrow, it is it's forgotten. That's not the kind of peace we're talking about. That was why Jesus said, I leave my peace with you. Not the fragile peace, the peace that can be broken. Do not take your peace from anybody. Because no matter the peace anybody gives to you, it will be broken. It's fragile. It doesn't last. 
So accept the peace of God. Do not put your trust in anyone. Don't think the government can give you peace. Don't think that the location, your location or the country you dwell or the country you live in can give you peace. The peace that Jesus gives is not, is not according to location or according to your bank account. It's not according to your popularity or fame or who loves you doesn't love you. It is a peace from the shepherd himself. He says, I give you this peace. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we will not lose it. We will not lose this peace. Amen. We will not do anything that will make that peace to be withdrawn. Amen. I encourage you tonight, accept that peace. Amen. Accept the peace. David accepted it. And that was why he was confident to write Psalm 23, the Psalm of Refreshment. So you two tonight, I encourage you, join hands with David. Let's, let, don't let us leave that garden. You know, one day I'm going to talk about God, God's garden. Because he gave me revelation some days ago. You know, if when you, have, when you understand what that garden represents, you don't want to leave that garden. But I just want to give you a tip. Do not leave that garden. Stay in the presence of the Lord. Stay in the presence of the Lord. The world does not give peace. Your job cannot give peace. Your spouse cannot. I always say to people, you know, and they say, my husband is troubling me. My wife is troubling me. I said, your joy or your peace does not lie with man. Or else you will go crazy. Because they don't have it. You don't, they can't give you. can give what you don't have. Nobody has a peace except Jesus. He is a shepherd of, he knows what, where to take you to. He, know, he knows how to pamper you, how to prepare a six course meal before you. So would you hide yourself underneath a shadow tonight? <laughs> and say, Lord, I accept your peace. And if that peace, if you have not yet accepted it, if you don't have it, say, Lord, that peace you said you have prepared, you are not just going to manufacture it and it's not fragile. Lord, I accept that peace tonight. In the name of Jesus. And I want you to begin to declare peace. Over every storm of your life. Begin to declare peace of God. Peace be still. When the disciples were afraid. On the boat. On the, on, on the sea of Galilee. And Jesus told them. He said peace. When the storm came. He said peace. Every time it's about peace. Peace. Can you say Lord. Can you begin to declare that peace. Say Lord. Peace upon my home. Peace upon my health. Peace upon my children. Peace upon my business. Peace upon my ministry. Peace in every area of my life. Peace. Peace in the name of Jesus. Begin to declare peace. Peace, peace, peace. The peace that is not fragile. The peace that is perfect. The perfect peace that Jesus gives. The peace in his presence. The peace that comes from goodness and mercy following you. The peace of the shepherd. Can you begin to accept it tonight? Say, Lord, I declare your peace, your peace over my life in the name of Jesus. Peace in my home, peace in my life, peace in my business, peace in my health, peace or in my neighborhood, peace in my nation, peace in my church, peace in my community, peace, peace in the name of Jesus. Every area of my life, peace in my house, peace in the lives of my children, peace in the name of Jesus. You know, the Bible says, our children shall be taught of the Lord and grace shall be the peace because you can't buy money. You can't buy peace with money. No matter how rich you are, you cannot buy peace. If money could buy peace, I think many nations would have peace by now. But it's only Jesus that gives peace, the shepherd of our soul. Shepherd of our soul, we give you full control of our lives. And I also want you to rededicate yourself to Jesus. I want you to rededicate yourself to him. Rededicate your life. Dedicate everything that pertains to you to him. Your children, your marriage, your home, your business, your life, your spouse. Dedicate everything. Say, Lord Jesus, you are the shepherd of my soul. I rededicate my life to you. I dedicate my children to you. I dedicate my home to you. I dedicate my career to you. Everything about me, I dedicate to you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I release myself to you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Because from your mouth, you said you give peace. You have the peace that can steal every storm. We thank you for peace in our home. We thank you for peace in our lives. We thank you, Lord. No, we might not be billionaires, but we have what money cannot buy. We thank you for the peace you've given to us. 
peace over our health in the name of Jesus. Every storm that rages in our body, we command peace, peace, peace of God to rest upon us. Every storm be still in the name of Jesus. As we go through life, your goodness and mercy shall follow us. I want you to declare it and say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise. Lord, if everything else fails, Lord, your word can never fail. You said heaven and earth shall pass away. Not a dot, not an iota of your word shall pass away unfulfilled. Your word has said to us that only goodness and mercy shall follow us. Nothing else. What else can we ask for? What more can we ask for? When your goodness and mercy, your goodness that represents you, your mercy that represents you is you, God, following us, covering us, anointing our head with oil for prevention, for protection, for healing. Lord, we thank you for power. We give you all the glory. Father, we thank you for the series on the psalm of refreshment. Thank you for refreshing us, oh Lord. Lord, through this series, oh Lord, and we will never leave this garden of refreshment in the name of Jesus. No temptation of the world will remove us out of this garden of refreshment that you have, you have made for us. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. Father, may your grace follow us. As we go to bed tonight, oh Lord, we ask that your spirit of peace will rest upon us in the name of Jesus. We will experience your peace anew, afresh, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for everyone on this platform. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you have afforded us tonight that you have given to us. We give you all the glory. Blessed Redeemer, be glorified, be magnified. When we meet next week, oh Lord, may our testimony be full, may our joy be full, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. We thank you because all the pharaohs that have been pursuing us not allowing us to experience peace. Father, tonight you have you have you have sunk them, sunk them completely in the Red Sea. And we have our peace. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless you. In the name of Jesus. God bless you.